Beginning with the simpler neoclassical lines, this pattern even has fewer pieces. Each piece was cut out with the large skirt lengths cut three times. The cotton was manufactured on a 39-inch loom. Thank you, Becky. Thanks, Jill. By the 1830s, the railroad had a commercial railway line from Liverpool to Manchester. Louis Daguerre developed photography, and this is his 1839 daguerreotype of a Parisian street. During the 1820s, improvements in roller printing technology result, resulted in increasing the amount of bright and rich colors and extremely intricate, intricate patterns. Small children were regularly used in the cotton factory to scramble between the looms and collect the loose cotton or quickly retie broken threads. They worked side by side with adults for 76 hours a week. Nicole and Adri, please come in. As the high-waisted straight skirts of the Regency began to fill out, the sleeves began to grow in size. The gown that Nicole is wearing was originally made from a lightweight cotton with, with a still slightly high waist and growing skirt and sleeves. The original fabric shows the roller print with its bright lavender and green irises. This is a close up of the center back closure showing the, the closure showing the linen lining with the hooks and eyes that resemble hooks and eyes that we use today. And here is the pattern for the 1825 gown. If the width of the fabric is the same as the skirt, which is the bottom piece, which is likely, then the fabric was 34 inches wide. If that were the case, this dress would take about eight yards of fashion fabric and perhaps two yards of linen lining. We'll turn our attention to Adri. This is another romantic period dress. Mary Bufton was a smock maker before she got married. Smocks were work clothes worn by agricultural workers. Her wedding gown was a simple cotton dress, which was practical enough. It could have been used for other occasions. The bodice was cut on a diagonal, which helped to emphasize the size of the sleeves. And the sleeves measured at least 63 inches across the cap. Also, the sleeves are cut, on, I mentioned, on the bias, which allows a stretch to the bottom part of the sleeve from wrist to elbow, so that it can fit quite snugly. This pattern is an interesting combination of bright, pastel, and muted colors. The pattern is quite abstract. Mary was a precise seamstress and the inside of her garment is as beautifully stitched as the outside. The fabric of this was 26 inches wide, which shows the skirt on the skirt panels. You look, this is the sleeve panel. This, this I discovered late last night. <laughs> and if you cut that part out, that's, the, that's where the, um, the, the cuff is. There's the fullness of the sleeve. But it wasn't wide enough to get the whole sleeve on the bias. So that is stitched on right here. And it's so much gather that it doesn't show. That's really cool. <laughs> we didn't do it on this one. We'll do it on the next time we, we, we make this dress. So this is Mary Buffin's wedding dress pattern. Ladies, thank you. During 1851 in London, Prince Albert hosted the great exhibition of the works of in the industry of nations also called the Crystal Palace. Exhibits included everything from massive steam engines to the latest camera. And in the American exhibit, Elias Howe's sewing machine dazzled the ladies and suggested that a drudge pastime might be made exciting and fun. During the 1850s, masses of heavy petticoats were replaced with a hoop cage. 
William Morris, this is a William Morris tile. William Morris was the father of the arts and crafts movement, a style that was a backlash against mechanized industry. And this closely fit jacket contrasts with the full extent of the crinoline. Cherie is modeling the gown from 1865. Each skirt panel is flanked one side with the selvage fabric on the other. When it's cut and sewed selvage to bias, selvage to bias, it pulls the dress back. Also, if you look closely, you see that delicate pattern reminiscent of the William Morris tiles. Speaking of old perspiration, <laughs> I don't get to say that often in a sentence. Um, <laughs> the underarm of the original bodice has armpit stains, which accelerated the damage to the silk. A good reason to see that clothes are thoroughly and regularly clean. Mm -hmm. The braided trim on the gown was an influence by uniforms from the Crimea War. It's all that braid across the front. The peplum of the bodice is edged with fringe and two rows of velvet ribbon. Similar trim is along the cuff of the sleeves. Note the center front skirt and center front back are rectangles. And then those, are, those wedge pieces are all double cut. So there are 10 wedges in this skirt. And if you look, this is, this is how wide the fabric is. It was a, a very small, narrow, off a small, narrow, narrow silk loom, but, but they were all like uh, spooned together to be able to cut them out of that narrow fabric. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Isn't she just lovely? <laughs> we have to give a, can I have a wide load thing in the back? Um, <laughs> 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 in the nicest possible way. <laughs> Mocha had a signature style that enveloped sinewy curves of the pre-Raphaelite art movement, silhouette marrying rigid tradition with playful movement. Many women worked long hours in tight, cramped factories, constructing ready-to-wear garments. The telephone began to work its way into every business and eventually homes, but it was never a phone. Or it was never a camera then. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> the automobile began to change lives of everyone. And the large leg of mutton sleeves and shaped skirt helped to coin the phrase, Laura, the hourglass figure. Laura is modeling the next gown. This original suit featured a lovely green woolen tartan with a blue-green velvet leg of mutton sleeve. A military motif is on the jacket and it is all trimmed with fur. Inside the jacket shows how the waist is nipped in and each of the seams are rigidly boned. On the jacket, the swags of teal cording are similar to an officer, a very young Winston Churchill. It is remarkable to note that the size of the sleeve are almost the same size as one of the skirt pattern pieces. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. 1910 really marks the beginning of the fashion change that defined the 20th century. This is part of the Russian Diaghilev ballet production of Scheherazade with costumes designed by Leon Bass, which swept Paris by storm. Within weeks, the fashion houses were coming out with designs that were inspired by the Arabian Nights. In 1910, the American arts and crafts continued to be inspired by the importance of hand craftsmanship over the dehumanizing impersonal mass production that had defined social progress since the Industrial Revolution began. The Model T, -T becomes the first car mass produced for middle class consumers. The completion of the Panama Canal increased <coughs> trade from all parts of the world. This gown shows the softer lines of the influence of the Far East to Western dress. Nicole? As this dress
dress was originally white, it actually looks much the same as the original. This, game, this garment became softer and simpler with a combination of complicated lace details which seemed to give a nod to the complexities of the past with a style relaxation of the modern era. This gown was by far the most complicated to pattern and construct. And I bow once again to Michelle. <laughs> I spent several eight-hour days trying to sort out the order the garment needed to be constructed. It was difficult to sort out how big the bodice was with, with the 18 tiny pin tucks or the lace triangles and ribboning. It did not have an apparent linear way for the construction technique. I still need to sit down and figure out a way to translate it into modern thinking and sewing order. It's a close-up of some of those pin tucks and another. Um, this is just a working pattern for this one. I anticipate the final pattern will be deconstructed into much smaller pieces. I think it's my favorite. I don't, I don't want to have favorite children, but <laughs> I think it's my favorite. Thank you, Nicole. 19... 16, the war to end all wars was beginning its third year. Women were filling in as men were enlisted or conscripted to all kinds of jobs. These women are working in a munitions factory. By and large, colors were muted and garments became shorter and looser. Burberry was commissioned by the War Office to translate a heavy wooling officer's coat into a lightweight, waterproof gabardine version, giving birth to the trench coat. The everyday dress followed suit and became less structured, and the skirt had comfortable fullness. Rachel? Rachel Miller is modeling the dress from 1916. Interestingly enough, the original linen garment has everything that we see from other dresses during the war, except for its lovely, soft pink color. Perhaps this was a conscious backlash from the drab and depressing cloud that was hovering over the world at that time. The bodice is securely and practically tucked into the skirt, held together with several sets of snaps and hooks and eyes. The bodice front has lovely pleats from neck to waist. And here is the pattern of the 18, 1916 skirt and box. Thank you, Rachel. At the end of the 1914-1918 war, insult, insult was added to injury with the outbreak of one of the worst influences. More people were killed by illness than died on the battlefield. The airplane became a standard part of the 20th century. Women gained the right to vote in the late teens and early 20s. Straight lines were introduced into women's fashion, a far cry from the traditionally feminine curves of only 20 years ago. Haley models the next gown. This brocaded lace was one of the most difficult to replicate. When I was shopping for lace, I could not find any of this Venetian lace for less than $300 a, 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 a yard. <laughs> so not in my budget. <laughs> but this is a this is a Battenberg lace um, table runners. <laughs> it really looks quite lovely. <laughs> this gown is made from rectangles of beautiful woven cream brocade and extraordinary Venetian lace. As most of the shapes are rectangles, it became easier to work from a sketch. The gown was held together with small snaps across the shoulders and down the front, all hidden in the lace. And the sleeves and the hemp bottom are edged with small balls, originally crocheted covered. At present, the only pattern we have is the sketch that I did, and, and it's another sketch of the gown, and a raglan sleeve, which I made last um, over the spring break. Again, I will have to expand the specifications of, this pa of these pattern pieces. Thank you, Haley. In 1925, Clara Bow was the it girl because she had it. 
<laughs> Women's hemlines were not ashamed to show their knees. They rouged their knees and turned their stockings down. Howard Carter discovered King Tutankhamun's tomb and the Egypt mania swept the world. The Art Deco styling reflected the modern streamlined world of the future. The ideal woman was young and sassy, a far cry from the monobosomed matron from the previous generation. Sam is modeling this adorable drop waist dress. This silk striped frock reflects the geometric lines of the Art Deco style. The neckline has an overlapping surplus front. The back of the dress is almost exactly the same as the front of the dress. Not suited to all physiognomies. <laughs> Remember how disappointed Julie Andrews was in Thoroughly Modern Millie when her beads didn't hang straight? <laughs> Both sides of the skirt have deep knife pleats allowing an ample stride but maintaining the vertical lines. And here is the pattern. Thank you, Sam. Listen, isn't that like just cuter than a button? <laughs> September 3rd, 1938, the United Kingdom declared war on Germany. In 41, the United States declared war on Japan, and by 45, 113 com countries were involved. All supplies were channeled into the war effort, and heavy restrictions were placed on civilian clothing. Clothes were rationed in the UK, whereas the United States manufacturers were heavily restricted with what they could make and sell. Women's clothing shortened from long skirts of the 30s and shoulders took on boxy, military uniform look. In the United Kingdom, all utility items were marked with the CC41 label, which stood for Controlled Commodity 1941. In the United States, a similar law was Limited Order L85. <coughs> the United Kingdom gave, gave out pamphlets that encouraged women to recycle and mend everything they owned. They even gave instructions on how to take part of man's suit, abandoned by very a lot of men that went to go fight in the war that came back to really no suits. <laughs> True. And um, the, the, the women often made those a suit for themselves or a suit for their children. And if you want to find out more about this, and you have 18 minutes of your life you never want to get back, you can Google my Make Women Men Talk. <laughs> Ration and utility austerity is epitomized in the CC41 rayon frock. Megan is modeling this dress. And here are a set of women in CC41 dresses. The original dress was a lovely rose color, and the dress is made from rayon crepe. Almost all fabric replaced with rayon, which could imitate wool, silk, linen, or cotton. Dresses were restricted to two yards of fabric, six seams, two box pleats, three buttons, and style lines only in the back. Towards, or only in the front, the back is plain. Towards the end of the war, the tide began to turn for the Allies, and some clothing restrictions began to relax a bit. This dress has five buttons and a few more than six seams which leads us to that this is at the very end of the war, and indeed I found out this was made in 1945. It was interesting during our first fitting, it was made from a white cotton, and I was disappointed that it looked like a mid 20th century nurse's uniform. Once we made it out of the rayon crepe, the dress looked perfect. I was in the UK during spring break, and I looked at a lot of garments that we had questions about and one of them, I noticed that there was no facing in this dress. Totally in keeping with the austerity, only in the style lines that had been relaxed. The things like restrictions on facing hadn't been. And here is the pattern for the CC41 dress. Thank you, Megan. And with Megan's dress, that was the last of the 11 gowns that I wanted to show you today. Uh, thank you for letting me share with you some of my discoveries. And please, ladies, would you come back on?
the difference was between working class and upper class. Obviously, fabrics were much more expensive, but do you see a real reduction in the complexity of gowns because the women have less time to spend on making their own clothes, or is it the same well, they, but just cheaper fabrics? Well, they, the, you see a variety of things changing, and, and as people move more and more into the workforce, there you start seeing things like uh, uh, manufactured clothes being available. But at the beginning, when these ladies would have been, they would have, if they said they were going to buy a new dress, they really meant that they had bought some yardage to take to a dressmaker. And, and that, that there wouldn't have been something off the rack for them at all. And um, the lower classes would have probably <coughs> bought things used or be given stuff or, I mean, it was a, it was a lot different dissemination of of goods, and they have, and, and the lower classes would have very few options. Um, but when the fabrics actually became more accessible when all these cotton frocks, there was that you know as as, as the slave trade got more horrendous here, the, the cotton became cheaper and cheaper. And there was a time where the Brits wanted to come in um, and fight on the side of the South during the Civil War, but they had already gotten rid of slavery, so they couldn't like you know emotionally do that. But a lot of cotton mills um, closed up during the um, Civil War in Britain. Yeah, yeah. In, in terms of these 11 examples, it, could you go down into man hours per dress, like uh, roughly how much it took just to build these mock-ups? Well, um, uh, Michelle made eight of them, so she probably could tell you to the minute, and she can tell you at what point you had to put it in a closet and not, you know, yell at it for a minute. Um, um, and, and Mandolin and, and Joy and um, Spencer made three of them, so they could probably tell you exactly what it was. A lot. Two semesters. Two semesters. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on how much experience. Mandela did a great job. She was like learning as she did it. She did a great job. She did she did um, the little 20s piece. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, fair amount of man hours, yeah. You know, but you, you know, but we You didn't show them by hand. No, Michelle, no, Michelle put her foot down on that one. <laughs> but I discovered lots of times, some, lots of times it goes faster than you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yes, yes. The uh, World War II restrictions, was that just uh, manufactured dresses that were being sold, or did you have fashion police going around seeing what you were doing at home? Well, uh, no, you, you had um, more freedoms at home, but you were restricted how much fabric you could get in the United Kingdom. The U.S. had a lot less restrictions, um, but they, they, they didn't have uh, grocery coupons for clothes in the United States, but they did in Britain. And um, it was, they were just trying to survive. They were, you know, trying to dodge U-boats and hang, hang on by their fingernails. So, um, but um, th those restrictions wouldn't have been applied at home. That's why if you took apart an old garment, you could do anything you wanted with it. And there's lots of instructions in those Make Do and Men books on how to take apart, you know, grandma's or grandpa's suit or one of those old things and make whatever you wanted to out of it. There was a lot of that. But it was also patriotic to be able to follow these rules. You know, I mean, the Brits kind of did, did that whole, you know, blitz mentality where they were like, we, you know, we've got to follow the rules. I think they're good at that. Okay. Talk to us about the pin tucks. Um, oh, in the, this one? Yes, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Michelle. <laughs> Michelle, these are all just like little teeny, like tiny things. How long did that, that pack a long time? A week. A week. <clears throat> <laughs> and Michelle's the fastest stitcher I know. So, we yeah. Those were really in style in the 80s because I remember making a dress that had like 500 <laughs> pin tucks. So, I mean, these things do come back. I, mean, I, I, I actually tried that. to look for pre pin tuck fabric because I didn't want anybody to have to do that. So. Yeah, yeah, Tizzy. Um, I noticed the second model is wearing a very interesting hat. Yeah. Uh, and it's, yeah, a, it's a really cute bonnet. That, I pulled out of storage. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. I didn't want one exactly like this one. So uh, this is actually. It was also. It was actually like really badly dyed and distressed, and we use it as Winnie dyed. And, and um, I stripped it and washed it and bleached it and made it look better. <laughs> I'm good at that. <laughs> Well, my question would be, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I <guess. laughs> is, is that, of course, each of these dresses is like going through history, mm -hmm. you know, it, it tells that story of history, so do you study hats also, because hats are 
Yeah, well, it's like, you, you know, I always tell actors if they have the wrong shoes, they might as well, you know, wrong haircut, they might as well just, you know, go hold. Because <laughs> <laughs> you you're, you're destroying that verisimilitude. I, you know, it makes me nuts. <laughs> So, yeah. Pardon. Anything else? I, I'm really, this has been such a fun project. You can't even imagine how much I'm enjoying it. And I'll be able to get, yeah, yes, yeah, so, Adrian. Is, is there a limit? I know you said you washed your hands. <coughs> but if we imagine that a, a work of art hanging on a wall from 400, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, no one would be letting you touch the texture to find out more about it. So. Yeah. Is, it, is there a limit to how many people a year can touch some of these garments? Well, I, I how does was that shocked. Work? When Darren and I first went there, we first met off the year when we were working on a big hair big chair, and we brought little white gloves with us. She went, oh, take those off. Go wash your hands. You need to touch this. It was like, I found my nirvana. <laughs> I was just shocked. And she said, no, no, no. This is, you know, we, we, they're very careful with it, and everything is packed very carefully with aspirin paper. And, and nothing is creased, so like the sleeves will be stuffed with it. And I mean, every time I put it away, I had to be, you know, incredibly gentle with it. And I was really careful whenever I took it out. There's a couple of them that are falling apart, and I decided I don't want to work on those. They're they're too fragile. So I made sure that I, I you know, I went on to a different one that had a little more um, a, a structural integrity. Told me, but I can't remember. What is the oldest garment you've worked on so far? Or seen? Uh, the oldest one that I have a pattern for is from uh, 1730. Yeah, there aren't a lot from the. There's a lot from the 18th century. There's this crazy guy who was in the early 20th century, and he decided he wanted to have his own private 18th century collection. His name was Charles Wade. He also collected samurai armor and toys. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, and, 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 it, and this, this, the, the, most of the things at Snow's Hill Manor were the beginning of his collection. Um, but there's, I think the oldest piece is like right, maybe 1720. What were the best notes that you'd seen? Oh, yeah. Uh, when I was in Hereford in, at um, um, spring break, Althea took me to this Catholic church, church in Abigaveni where she was helping store the vestments. And they were, were making this, this cushion that it could sit in this little cedar chest. And uh, so we were moving it out and kind of taking a pattern out of the outside of it. And um, this is so beautiful. When was this? And this lovely little old lady who was in charge of it, she goes, well, this one is 1505. <laughs> and I went up and I went like this. I said, I just, ha I just have to touch it. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I was shocked. It was stunningly beautiful, and they still use it occasionally for services. I was, yeah, yeah, and it was, it, you know, it was Catholic. It was like, where did, was it during Henry VIII? I mean, how did it live? I mean, where, where's it hidden? I was like, I wanted the story. <laughs> yeah, Pamela. The Fiend of Clay one. Mm -hmm. Her arms obviously don't take up all of the inside of that. No, piece, no, so no. We, 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 we put some. We put some net in there. Is that what they would have done? Would they would have. Been, he, he, sometimes there would be a little bit of. Um, they used to use a variety of things, but they would they'd use some crunchy, like like the polished cotton or something. Yeah. Um, you can you can put. Well, they just stuff it every time they wore it, or is well, it sometimes you would have there? sometimes you would have little plumpers that you would wear under whatever puff sleeve you had. Kind have. of like the shoulder pads. Yeah, like shoulder pads. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like shoulder pads that you would wear in the eighties. Yeah, like those. Anything else? This is really my, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> okay, thank you. I really appreciate you. Guys. Thank you all for coming. Um, please stay as long as you like. Help they us with see. a little bit more grazing, as our boss would say. There, it, it looks like there's still some nice dessert over there. Um, Nancy, on behalf of the college, thank you very much. And would you please accept this um, print by one of your colleagues, Associate Professor Kathy Pusey, as a token of our gratitude for your time. Nancy, notice the title on it. Fuel the fire. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm up for that. <laughs> thank you, Elaine. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Ladies, I think you can go change and then you need to eat. Huh? Let me get some more. Oh,